Tutanota has new email plans. System76 computers are once again disabling Intel Management Engine, a widespread and major Move It vulnerability. Apple WWDC updates, some Gen Z research that got a surprising number of reactions, and more. Welcome to Surveillance Report 137, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news in the last week. I'm Henry from TechWar. I'm Nathan from The New Oil. You know what we're going to do? We're going to do a promo <laughs> segment. And do you know what's new? <laughs> Nothing. So again, if you want to support this podcast, Patreon is the best way to do it. We really value all of your support. And um, it's the best way you can give back to this podcast. Right now, we don't really accept sponsors or anything. So really, this is almost completely viewer supported. So if you want to support this podcast and keep us going, patreon.com slash surveillance pod is the way to do it. And there are links down in the description. And you also get a lot of cool perks, like you get to join our Q&A. You also get an exclusive version of this podcast with more content and removed segments like this one. So yeah, definitely check that out if you want to support this podcast. We also support LibraPay for a more private alternative to Patreon. And we also support Monero. So if you want to just directly contribute to us, that is awesome. We have an internal threshold for Monero, and when it hits that, then we disperse the funds 50-50, and we recently hit that threshold. So woo, woo, woo. Um, I know it doesn't really matter much for all of you, but for us, that's really big news. And so we want to thank all of our Monero supporters. Okay, since we can't remember or care who took last week's highlight story, I'm going to go ahead and start this week. And the headline says, New Tuta Nota Plans. And this comes from, shocker, Tuta Nota. Loosely quoting the article, they said to make this change happen, they were, I, you know, I'm cutting bits of the article out here. They're talking about things like uh, quantum secure encryption, and they promised there's an upcoming uh, encrypted cloud storage coming soon. So to make these changes, changes happen, we need to grow our team at a much faster pace than in the past. This has led to the tough decision to raise prices, but we do not want to simply charge more for the same packages, which is why we are adding benefits to each plan so that you can get more value in exchange. Hold on there for existing customers. They'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we're also simplifying the pricing structure by offering predefined plans with the best set of features for each type of user and discontinuing the option to pay for add-ons on top of a selected plan. So anyways, yeah, so basically Tutanota uh, acknowledges that they want to roll out some pretty cutting edge features again, like quantum secure encryption, encrypted drive. I guess that one's not really so, so much cutting edge, but basically they want to grow their team. They want to keep paying their team a decent living wage, which I think we can all agree with just to go over the personal plans here. There are business, there are changes to the business plans too, but for the sake of time, we'll just kind of pass through those. The personal plan is going to start off at three euros a month. You will get 20 gigabytes of storage, 15 alias email addresses, unlimited folders and filters, unlimited search, offline mode, auto reply, unlimited calendars, unlimited shared calendars, unlimited calendar invites, quote unquote, and more. This will also include all security features like two-factor uh, session handling, biometric, and pin unlock in the app. The next step up will be legend, eight euros a month. That's 500 gigs of space, 30 alias email address, 10 domains with catch-all, everything included in the previous plan. They also note that if you switch now to the new plans, they will give you a one-time offer of two years for the price of one. So basically 50% off. And this offer is only valid for three weeks. So I think you'll have about two more weeks left at the time that we release this, give or take. Basically, if I understood the article correctly, you can stay where you are. Um, you don't have to upgrade. You will have all your same features. You will keep renewing at the same price. You just won't be able to add any new stuff until you upgrade. Um, so if you're already paying for Tutanota and you're happy where you are, you can stay put or you can go ahead and upgrade, get this uh, this like one-time offer and um, help support the company. From a business perspective, I really applaud that whole thing of like, we don't just wanna raise prices, we want to like actually offer something in return. Being a business owner myself, I, I feel really weird just like asking for donations and free money. I always wanna give people something in return, which is why, that's like the main reason I opened a merch shop to be totally honest with you guys. In my opinion, this is still pretty darn cheap. Um, I. I don't know, three euros a month doesn't sound like that much to me. And also to be fair, there's still free plans. So like people who are really tight on money can still get access to, um, you know, encrypted email. I believe there's some calendars included in the free, pan free plan, just a limited number. Like you still get access to some of these features. So I don't know, I, I like this. I don't have any issues with this. I mean, like, I don't love it. It's not a 
good thing. But I mean, sure, I never like thing. to see prices go up in general, but right, it's it's just a necessary thing. This is how yeah, exactly. things are going. There's been inflation, things change. You know, um, Tutanota has to evolve, and I don't think that what they're doing is done for the purpose of just making money. Otherwise, they would do something crazy. Like they have very good reasons for raising prices, and they're still offering free plans. They're still allowing you to stay on your current plan. So. Yeah, I, I don't have any issues with how they did it. It, it just sucks, but it's, it doesn't suck because of anything they did wrong, I don't think. All right, well, let's move into the data breaches. Honda API flaws exposed customer data, dealer panels, and internal documents. Honda's e-commerce platform for power equipment, Marine, Lawn, and Garden was vulnerable to unauthorized access by anyone due to API flaws that allow password reset for any account. The researcher exploited a password reset API to reset the password of valuable accounts and then enjoy unrestricted admin level data access on the firm's network. This data included customer names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, items ordered, dealer websites, including the ability to modify them, dealer user accounts, including first and last name and email address. It was also possible to change the password, which is fun. Uh, internal financial reports and possibly private keys for Stripe, PayPal, and Authorize.net, which is pretty serious. The data could be used for launching phishing campaigns, social engineering attacks, or sold on cybercrime forums and dark web markets. Also having access to the dealer websites, attackers could plant credit card skimmers or other malicious JavaScript snippets. This is pretty serious, so I hope that they have uh, taken the necessary actions to get this resolved. All right, our next story comes from the University of Manchester, who says that attackers likely stole data in a cyber attack. So the university for... The rest of us not in the UK who didn't know this, the university is a public research institute and one of the UK's largest and most successful education and research hubs with over 10,000 staff and 45,000 students. Currently, the university's members aren't required to reset their passwords, but high vigilance against potential phishing attacks is advised. Unfortunately, that's kind of all the details we have at this time. They didn't say what data was stolen, how many people were affected, etc. We'll keep you updated if we hear more. Turkish citizens' personal data offered online after a government site was hacked. The website's called sorgapaneli.org, which I think is how you say that. It's an offering to provide Turkish citizens private data, which was stolen from the eDevlet government services website. God, this was a weird way that this article wrote that. It's even claiming to be able to offer the president's personal information. The hacked information that is being offered for free by the website in return for a membership signup includes ID numbers, phone numbers, and information about people's family members. More sensitive information, including full addresses, real estate deeds, and education details is being offered with a paid premium membership. Experts said that the data theft is the biggest yet in Turkey and constitutes a major digital security problem. E-Devlet, which means e-government, is the main public administration portal in Turkey and includes personal information, including details about education, health, banking credentials, and tax status. For several years, the e-Devlet website has been criticized for not being secure enough, but the authorities have dismissed the claims. So this happens a lot, where people do call out issues, they are not fixed, and then they become actual issues. So, good job. Turkey. And our last data breach is just a quick update. It says another huge US medical data breach confirmed after Fortra mass hack. So this comes from in, um, God almighty. Why do these companies have weird names nowadays? Intelliheart X, Intelliharx, a Tennessee based company that handles patient payment balances and collections. They said in a notice filed with the Maine Attorney General's office, I feel like that's going to become the new AWS bucket, like just take a shot every time we know about a data breach because of the Maine Attorney General's office. Anyways, uh, in a filing, they said that 489,830 patients had information stolen in the cyber attack against their vendor, Fortra. And this is part of the whole, uh, Fortra is the go anywhere stuff, right? 99% yeah. sure. According to the notice, the attackers stole patient names, addresses, dates of birth, and social security numbers. The breach also compromised patient medical billing and insurance information, as well as diagnoses and medication. A not-so-fun fact that the article noted here, um, Excellion, Go Anywhere, and now Move It, which we're actually going to talk about next, all three of those were brought to you by the same ransomware gang. And now companies, more massive exploits. So there was an exploitation of critical move it flaw in rants, which is ransacking organizations big and small. So organizations are falling prey to the mass exploitation of a critical vulnerability in a widely used, again, people, file transfer program, just like the Fortra 
go anywhere weird nonsense. This is a common thing that we're seeing, very common where, you know, again, we've talked about this. You have these organizations, a lot of them are dependent on these very business oriented pieces of software and they have to use one thing for file transfer, one thing for something else, one thing for managing this one form, blah, blah, blah. And it's if there's if they find one vulnerability that thousands of companies are using, it impacts all of them. So I'm not going to be surprised if we're going to start seeing stories in the next coming weeks of companies that are going to um, fall prey to this and they're going to come out with all these major data breaches. So the exploit started over the Memorial Day holiday while the critical vulnerability was still a zero day and it still continues until this moment. As of Monday evening, payroll service Zealous, the Canadian province of Nova Scotia, British Airways, the BBC, the UK retailer Boots were all known to have had data stolen through this attack, which are fueled by a recently patched vulnerability in MoveIt. Both Nova Scotia and Zealous had their own instances or cloud services breached. All the hacking activity has been attributed to the Russian-speaking Klopp Crime Syndicate. This is the result of an SQL injection attack, and experts are claiming there's already double-digit victims with severely sensitive information exposed. So this is big. Um, we're probably going to see a lot more come out about this, so definitely stay subscribed and you will definitely catch more updates to other companies that were impacted by this. This is going to be one of those lingering issues that we're going to hear about for the next three months. All right, our next story comes from Google Cloud, who is partnering with the Mayo Clinic as it tries to expand its use of generative AI in healthcare. Every word of that was horrifying. Quoting the article, on Wednesday, Google Cloud said Mayo Clinic is testing a new service called Enterprise Search on Generative AI App Builder, which was introduced Tuesday. The tool effectively lets clients create their own chatbots using Google's technology to scour mounds of disparate internal data. There's a lot in this article, and I think it came from CNBC, so they didn't really elaborate much on uh, really anything. But uh, specifically, I, I looked for, you know, okay, who's talking about the privacy stuff here? And I found this bit. Google said its approach to privacy ensures customers retain control over their data and noted the new service is compliant with HIPAA. The Mayo Clinic says they have created safe sandboxes for workers to test applications of the technology and identify where it can be most helpful, unquote. Um, so yeah, again, given the target audience of the outlet, which is CNBC, they really didn't elaborate on that or go into detail about how Google plans to protect privacy. But yeah, you know, Google health data, any of these big tech companies and health data, I mean, unless you're new around here, I don't really have to spell it out for you. Um, up next, um, we know we wrote different notes for this, but I'm going to condense a lot of this down into just kind of one general coverage of Apple's WWDC. Um, there weren't that many privacy updates this year. Last year, there was like a flood of privacy and security updates from Apple. Um, there still were things this year, though. So the first thing, um, iOS 17 now automatically removes tracking parameters from links you click on. So some links uh, have tracking parameters that can detect uh, individual users. Pretty much Apple is now going to disable this, which is really nice. Um, there's some more details that are down below. Again, I'm just going to do quick coverage of this. Um, also, Apple TV is going to support VPN apps on tvOS 17, um, which is really freaking cool. Um, we don't know if there's going to be limitations yet, but it's just a cool thing already for them to kick this off. Um, some other major things, you can now share pass keys across uh, user accounts that are shared inside of iCloud Keychain. Lockdown mode, this is kind of under discussed, but lockdown mode's actually been expanded. So there are now a lot more restrictions within lockdown mode in Safari and other networking restrictions. So um, they've further hardened the operating system on lockdown mode, which is really freaking cool because it shows that they're expanding lockdown and it wasn't just a one-off feature. Um, and some of the things that they're implementing are really freaking cool there. They also have enabled lockdown mode for Apple Watch. So if you have an Apple Watch, you can enable lockdown mode starting with iOS 17. They now have uh, some further ad and tracking protection within Safari. And what my favorite announcement, uh, to be honest, was uh, progressive web apps for Safari. So Safari now has progressive web apps. Um, and this it shouldn't be a surprise given Apple just started releasing progressive web app, official progressive web app support on iOS starting with 16.4, but now they're really doubling down on web apps, which I think is just so exciting for the future of web apps. And um, I'm gonna continue to call out Firefox for not properly supporting web apps. I think it's really sad how Firefox years ago cut this out. And now if you go on the internet and download any browser, 
almost every browser except Firefox will properly support web apps. Just so you all know, Jonah and I actually covered these a little bit more thoroughly. So if you want um, kind of all of the WWDC privacy updates, we made a, like a three to four minute clip on um, our new Techler Clips channel that you can check out in the sources. And I'll leave a link down in the description as well if you wanna check out just the WWDC privacy and security updates. It's like three or four minutes of your time and it's a pretty good recap. And our last company story is a real quick one. It's another update. This comes from Gigabyte. So last week we talked about how um, Gigabyte firmware had basically a backdoor. Uh, it was not meant to be a backdoor. It was meant to be a, an update channel, but it was very poorly secured and could functionally act as a backdoor for Pretty much anyone who knows how to pick a lock. Quoting the article, Gigabyte has released firmware updates to fix security vulnerabilities in over 270 motherboards that could be exploited to install malware. The firmware updates were released last Thursday in response to a report by hardware security company Eclipsium, who found flaws in a legitimate Gigabyte feature used to install a software auto update in Windows. Yeah, if you're a Gigabyte user and you were affected by this, definitely go out and download this if you can. Pretty much all I got. Now we're gonna go into research. So RedRays has discovered major cybersecurity leak that affects 4,800 domains. This is a little bit self promotional, but it does contain interesting stats nonetheless. They unveiled stats um, regarding the reach across various domains and systems for over 4,800 companies worldwide. The origin of these user credentials remains uncertain, but there are suspicions that a large-scale phishing or malware attack could be the source. This affects such companies like unnamed top cryptocurrency exchanges, Google accounts, and even government domains, including thousands of SAP, Oracle, and WebSphere accounts, and over 100 banking institutions. If this is a new data set, as the article implies, this is pretty shocking. If it's just aggregated data, which is also possible, it creates an interesting snapshot about how widespread breaches are and can be, but uh, we don't actually know that for certain. I am so stoked I got this story actually, because when I posted this story on the new oils Mastodon, I got a lot of responses and I'm excited to share my thoughts. So the headline, um, this comes from the Cato Institute. The headline says nearly a third of Gen Z favors the government installing surveillance cameras in homes. All right, I'm going to quote a lot of the article here, but I think they really like really did a good job of summing it up, so bear with me. In a newly released Cato Institute 2023 Central Bank Digital Currency National Survey of 2,000 Americans, we asked respondents whether they, quote, favor or oppose the government installing surveillance cameras in every household to reduce domestic violence, abuse, and other illegal activity, unquote. Not surprisingly, few Americans, only 14%, support this idea. Three-fourths, 75%, would oppose government surveillance cameras in homes, including 68% who strongly oppose, while 10% don't have an opinion either way. However, Americans under 30 favor this. Support declines with age, dropping 20% among 30 to 44 year olds and dropping considerably to 6% among those over age 45. We don't know how much of this preference for security over privacy or freedom is something unique to this generation or simply a result of youth. However, there is a reason to think that this is a gen uh, that this is generational. Americans over 45 have vastly different attitudes on in-home surveillance cameras than those who are younger. These Americans were born in or before 1978, thus the very youngest were at least 11 before the Berlin Wall fell, being raised during the Cold War amidst regular news of Soviet Union surveilling their own people may have demonstrated to Americans the dangers of giving government too much power to monitor people. Young people today are less exposed to these types of examples and thus less aware of the dangers of expansive government power. It is also possible that the increased support for government surveillance among the young has common roots in a uh, paper entitled Coddling of the American Mind. Young people seem more willing to prioritize safety from possible violence or hurtful words over ensuring robust freedoms from the government surveillance or to speak freely. Other demographics also differ in their tolerance of government surveillance in their homes. African Americans, 33%, and Hispanic Americans, 25%, are more likely than white Americans, 9%, and Asian Americans, 11%, to support in-home government surveillance, which surprises me, to be totally honest. Democrats, 17%, are also more likely than Republicans, 11% to support it, but not by a wide margin. This issue divides Democrats between those who identify as very liberal, in which only 9% support, 9% uh, support, and liberal, who are more than twice as likely to support at 19%. Notably, the issue doesn't divide men and women, who are 15 and 13%, uh, respectively, who are about equally likely to support. Last, last paragraph here. If these trends continue, the United States may confront a very different privacy landscape in the future. It is possible at some point the American public will be open to extreme government over reach in a world that feels scarier and more dangerous than before, whether or not it is. Thus, it is important to impart the learnings of the past and present about what can happen when government amasses too much power. Without explicitly telling younger generations about the risks and dangers of government surveillance, they will forget these lessons and may find themselves repeating devastating mistakes of the past, unquote. My main thought here is I would be really interested to know how these questions were framed. Because specifically that question, uh, where, where was it? 
favor or oppose the government installing surveillance cameras in every household to reduce domestic violence, abuse, and other illegal activity. Is this like in that perfect world where illegal wiretaps don't exist and everybody gets a warrant all the time? And like every, you know, it, it, for those who don't know, the American justice system, the prosecutor isn't supposed to be trying to put somebody in jail. They're supposed to be finding the truth. And if halfway through the trial, they realize they've got the wrong guy, they're supposed to drop the case. On paper, that's how it's supposed to work. So is this like a, was this question worded in a way where it's like, oh, it would only be used for this? If it is true, and this is just really like what you see is what you get, then I think, uh, like the last article said, I think that really just raises the um, the urgency that we spread the word of privacy and people understand like, yeah, this stuff could happen here uh, to various extents. It has happened here. And, you know, we we need to be on top of this stuff for many reasons. Or, you know, if if you are Gen Z, feel free to leave your comments in, in the comments section. I would be I really would be very interested to hear your thoughts. All right. Um, Night Fury documents detailed DHS project, which is called Night Fury, to give risk scores to social media users. So the DHS contracted the, the, universe, the University of Alabama at Birmingham, UAB, in 2018 to design methods of assigning a risk score to potential pro-terrorist accounts on social media, as well as identifying information of interest regarding illegal opiates opioid supply chain and disinformation efforts. These new documents come after Motherboard reported Customs and Border Protection was using an AI-powered tool called Babel, Babel X to analyze travelers' social media at the U.S. border. As a number of experts in machine learning and automated decision-making told DHS less than a year before the Night Fury contract was signed, attempting to make automated judgments about these matters is both impossible and likely to be infected with bias, as these characteristics have no concrete definition, much as there is no definition of being pro-terrorist. One of the privacy threshold analysis says UAB's work will initially be focused on counterterrorism. The project planned to develop um, methods that could identify a location without GPS met metadata, such as looking for certain keywords. The researcher also planned to track threats beyond mainstream social networks like Facebook and Twitter to other communities. DHS planned to test the methods against live events unfolding in real time. Another task was to create a Facebook group expander, which would automatically identify potential pro-terrorist social media accounts and Facebook groups where pro-terrorist groups interact. UAB would then constantly deliver lists of these accounts and related posts to the DHS. UAB was tasked with doing a similar thing on Twitter. The lesser social media networks DHS wanted UAB to study also included Telegram, Google+. <laughs> I know, right? That made me laugh. I know, like, ah, oh, Google+. Um, VK, Ask FM, and Zello. DHS awarded the contract in September 2018 with a potential award amount of over $3 million. DHS said it stopped work on the project in October and ended the contract in December 2019. So this has been kind of newly unveiled. Um, I think that this, for me, speaks to how powerful these tools can be and what they're trying to do on the other side of the spectrum and how they're trying to pretty much auto-scan everything that comes across the internet. So definitely something to keep on your radar, and it's not a fun thing that they're trying to do things like this. Uh, with that, we'll move into Microsoft paying $20 million for Xbox children privacy violations. According to the Consumer Protection Agency, the FTC, Microsoft allegedly collected and retained the personal information of children who had signed up for the Xbox Live service without requesting their parents' consent or even notifying them. The scandal. In some confirmed cases between 2015 and 2020, the FTC says Microsoft stored, children, stored children's data in its servers for several years. I didn't quote it here, but uh, the article also talks about how like there were even instances where, you know, when you sign up for an account and it's like, are you over 13? Sometimes children would click no and they would still be opted in to like newsletters and agree with the terms of service and the privacy policy, even though like no matter your definition or where you stand, Microsoft had blatant evidence that these kids were not old enough to be making accounts. Apart from the monetary penalty, the FTC has proposed measures that the tech giant must also adopt to ensure compliance with COPPA, which is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. That's why there's the whole are you over 13 thing. More specifically, Microsoft will now have to implement the following practices. They will have to inform parents of the additional privacy protections provided by creating a separate account for their child. They will have to obtain parental consent for accounts created before May 2021 if the account holder is still a child. They will have to delete all 
uh, personal data of COPPA protected users if, it's, if it is no longer needed for providing services that dictated the original collection. Delete all user data stored on a system that it collected without acquiring parental consent. Delete COPPA protected user data within two weeks from the collection date. Extend COPPA protections to third-party gaming publishers who receive user data from Microsoft. Ex and extend COPPA protections to biometric and health information collected for creating avatars if that collection is combined with personally identifiable information. There's been a victory. Yay. Wins. Some wins. <laughs> so New Jersey court rules police must give defendant the facial recognition algorithms used to identify him. So this court today ruled that state prosecutors who charged a man for armed robbery after the text showed he was a possible match for the suspect must turn over to the defendant detailed info about the face scanning software that was used, including how it works, its source code, and its error rate. Calling the facial recognition a novel and untested technology, the court in state of New Jersey versus Francisco Ortega held that the defendant would be deprived of due process rights unless he could access the raw materials police used to identify him and test its reliability to build a defense. The inner workings of the facial recognition software is vital to impeach witnesses. Yeah, this is honestly super cool. Um, it is, it's crazy to me this isn't the default. I can't believe that we're using these proprietary black box algorithms as a way to prosecute people. Like, it's insane. I can't believe this was ever a thing in the first place. It's pretty unhinged. Our next story comes from Kalamazoo, Michigan, where it says, after string of concerns, Kalamazoo pauses downtown police surveillance project. On Monday, June 5th, city of Kalamazoo postponed action on a $375,000 three-year contract with Fusus Inc. for a real-time crime center video and collaboration platform. The proposed system would allow police to connect to the live video camera feeds of any business that opts in. It would also streamline the process for residents to share videos with police, unquote. The big thing that stuck out to me was the article mentions how this seems to have largely come about from like a city hall. You know, a, a lot of, if you guys don't know this here in the US, a lot of the time cities will hold public meetings and they'll they'll like post it in the newspaper. They'll, I mean, they'll post it somewhere and they'll tell you like, hey, on this date at this time, these are the issues we're gonna come discuss. Floor will be open, come and talk. A ton of people came out and they were like, hey, we're not down with this, man. We have concerns. For the record, I know it's a pain. I It's, you know, I work a full-time job. I don't want to go sit at the city hall for three hours while I wait for this topic to come up. But it's important to note, guys, like, again, we say it all the time. This stuff can work sometimes. If if your city or your politicians or your, your representatives are doing things you don't agree with, contact them, let them know, feel free to show up. Just, yeah, sometimes it does work. All right, uh, sticking to our general goal of trying to just cover the privacy and security of political stories. Governor DeSantis signs a digital bill of rights. So DeSantis said he was planning the digital bill of rights, which he said establishes protections for Floridians in the digital space. He said it's aimed at restricting tech companies from collecting personal data. Uh, this includes the right to control your personal data, the right to know your personal data, the right to opt out of having your data sold, and the right to protect children from personal data collection. In Florida, the bill will ban government officials from coordinating with big tech to censor free speech. Now, last part's interesting, but um, regarding the whole like digital bill of rights thing regarding access and control of user data, I think this is a big win. So really awesome to see one more state head in the right direction. What are we at now? Like we're getting close to like a third of the states. <laughs> All right, our next story is a real quick update. New York City sues Kia and Hyundai over car thefts that went viral on TikTok. So we've mentioned in the past, um, there was... Long story short, apparently uh, Kias and Hyundais had some sort of vulnerability where you could literally just like plug in a USB cable and drive off with the car. I mean, I'm sure there were a few more steps than that, but not many. It was super, super easy. This went on for years, guys. Uh, the article really talks all about this. And uh, they finally got forced to like push out an update and fix this after years of viral videos. So now people are, of course, lining up to sue them. Uh, in its lawsuit, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York claimed that the automakers were guilty of negligence by failing to include auto theft devices in the cars that would have made them much harder to steal. Um, that was kind of the relevant quote there. I'd, I'd say failing to respond in a faster time, at least. I'd agree with negligence personally, but yeah. So that's happening. All right, Meta, AKA Facebook, AKA Mark Zuckerberg, uh, to let users refuse its cross-site tracking following German antitrust intervention. 
So Meta has been dragged kicking and screaming. Again, this author is kind of fun. Uh, so if you want to read this whole article, definitely recommend it. But I'm, we're kind of quoting here. Meta has been dragged kicking and screaming into another notable privacy concession in Europe. The German FCO has announced a new account center incoming, which will see the tech giant provide users of its social networking services with a greater degree of choice over whether they allow it to combine data on their activity across its services or not. It will be the first time Meta has provided such a degree of choice over its cross-site tracking and profiling. Pretty much they want to see Meta have a largely free and informed decision about whether they want to use Meta's services separately or in a combined form. It's kind of interesting. So they're trying to pretty much have Facebook be set up in a way where it's almost like you could use them individually. So quoting the article again, using the services in combined form would allow them to use additional functionalities such as cross-posting, where a post is simultaneously published across several social media outlets. But Meta would then use the combined data for advertising purposes. Um, so they're pretty much confirming that Meta's intending to bundle its ads processing of users' cross-platform activity with a service utility like cross-posting. So if you want to cross-post, you have to agree to being profiled across its services. You can't not do that. Hence, presumably the FCO's qualification at the choice is it's offering users is not actually free. Um, to kind of recap that, because it's a little confusing, what they're saying is in order to cross post content between Facebook profiles, you can't do that without Facebook profiling you between those platforms. There is not actually enough choice because you can't have multiple Facebook accounts without Facebook profiling you between them. So they're saying this isn't actually free for the user. So the SEO is stepping up and trying to put Meta in their place. Um, they said also, we understand the rollout of the new account center will begin this month because this is all kind of in light of Facebook rolling out this new universal um, account that you can use to integrate with all your Facebook products. And then they said that it will be applied globally rather than just for users in Germany, but it was driven by the Germans. So this is awesome. I think it also speaks honestly, Without Europe, <laughs> the last like three or four years, we would have like zero progress in privacy whatsoever. I'd say even the last decade, GDPR was started because of Europe. Um, everything that's happening to Apple right now, like Apple getting web apps, Apple moving away from Lightning is because of Europe. This new privacy stuff that's keeping Meta in check is because of Europe. I recently interviewed um, this the Vivaldi CEO, and he's also talking about how a lot of the stuff that allows you to even pick different browsers on your operating system, which didn't always used to exist, was because of stuff in Europe. It's almost like sometimes keeping these companies in check is actually good for people and gives people more freedom and more rights. But I don't know. And again, I'm not saying like we need to like overregulate these companies. It's just when these companies are completely abusing the individual rights of people nonstop, why is doing nothing the right response to that? Um, so it's really nice. And the cool thing is that Europe doing something about it helps the rest of the world. So. I think it's awesome. We will jump into our last political story, which says French Senate gives green light to surveillance through cameras and microphones. And uh, it's just as bad as it sounds. Quoting the article, in France, the Senate just approved a controversial provision to a justice bill that would allow law enforcement to secretly activate cameras and microphones on a suspect's devices. This type of surveillance would be activated without notifying the owner of the device. The same provision would also allow agencies easier access to geolocation data to track suspected criminals. Even though the officials say they would only use the new update to the so-called Keeper of Seals justice bill to capture sound and images of suspects of certain crimes, such as delinquency, organized crime, and terrorism, the critics say this would still be disproportionate. In addition, the project does not prohibit listening to conversations between the lawyer and her client in the lawyer's office, even if it's prohibited. So that's just one example where this could be um, pretty obviously problematic. The justice minister argues that all the necessary safeguards are in place. For example, every surveillance operation would have to be approved by a judge. And then uh, the article just had this little uh, short paragraph that I thought was really interesting. It says, activating cameras and microphones on a suspect's device might not be allowed for now, but the French law allows the government to monitor phone calls and emails of terrorism suspects without obtaining a warrant. Paris is now planning to go one step further. And the article uh, compared this bill to the, uh, the U.S. Patriot Act and... Um, just kind of drew some unpleasant parallels. So not doing great, France. And now the open source FOSS section. System76 makes, you know, computers that are pre-flash with Linux. The core boot that they use as the bootloader, which is an open source firmware, manages to now disable Intel management en engine for Raptor Lake. So 
Linux Laptop Desktop Vendor System76 has made improvements to their core boot, open firmware offerings to benefit the Intel Core 13th generation Raptor Lake, um, as well as prior generation devices. Uh, they have managed to disable the Intel Management Engine, ME, for their new Raptor Lake powered laptops. They also resolved a bug with core boot that allowed System76 to go ahead and re-disable Intel ME on relevant devices. Intel ME is disabled for their latest Lake laptops and most older platforms, with some exceptions, like how they're having a silicon issue with Tiger Lake. System76 uh, has also added a new firmware setup menu option for enabling or disabling UEFI Secure Boot. The motivation here with making it easier to toggle Secure Boot is for allowing Windows 11 support with SB active while running System76 open firmware. Some other recent firmware changes include increasing the battery power limits allowing greater CPU performance, NVIDIA Dynamic Boost for laptops with NVIDIA RTX 40 series graphics, and firmware security update improvements. Plus they made various fixes and also contributed Intel Maple Ridge Thunderbolt support to core boot. Cool stuff. Um, I, personally, not something that I'm super interested in myself, but I'm, I know that there's a lot of people who are really excited about these changes. Our next story is a quick update comes from KeePass. It says KeePass version 2.54 fixes bugs that leaked clear text master passwords. So in May of 2023, a security researcher disclosed a vulnerability and proof of concept exploit that allowed you to partially export extract the clear text KeePass master password from a memory dump of the application. Quoting the researcher, the problem is with secure text box X because of the way it processes input when the user types the password, there'll be leftover sp uh, strings. For example, if the password is password, uh, it will result in leftover strings uh, blank A, blank blank S, blank 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 S, blank 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 W, so on and so forth. This dumper allows the users to recover almost all master password characters apart from the first one or two, even if the workspace is locked and the program was closed recently. Over the weekend, the developer released KeyPass 2.54 sooner than expected, which is awesome. Uh, and all users of the 2.x branch are strongly recommended to upgrade to the newer version. Users of KeyPass 1.x, Strongbox, or XE, XC are not impacted by this vulnerability and thus do not need to migrate to a newer release. Although for the record, you should always keep updated to the latest release. The article started explaining how the developer fixed this. And there's actually a significant number of efforts that went into fixing this. Like, uh, as I always say, not a programmer, I could be wrong. I, I honestly don't think the developer was just like, oh, let me fix this. I have a feeling they looked at it and they were like, okay, let me fix this. But also this raises interesting questions about what about this and what about this? Cause it seems like they did a lot of stuff. So um, if you wanna know exactly how they fixed it and what some of those updates are, feel free to check the article. Otherwise just know that, you know, keep your stuff updated. And uh, just for the record, the article ends here. Keep in mind that the issue impacts only passwords typed into the program's input forms. So if the credentials are copy and pasted, or if you're like me and you use a YubiKey, there is no data leaking strings created in the memory, unquote. Up next, this one is a little bit sad. So Red Hat is dropping its support for LibreOffice. The Red Hat package managers for LibreOffice have recently been orphaned, according to a post by the Red Hat manager. And we're going to kind of cite the reasons that they gave behind this. Um, so the Red Hat Display Systems team has maintained the LibreOffice packages in Fedora for years as part of their work to support LibreOffice for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. For those who don't know, Red Hat um, is kind of the company that helps run Fedora. They're adjusting their engineering priorities for Red Hat Enterprise Linux for workstations and focusing on gaps in Wayland, building out HDR support, building out what's needed for color sensitive work and a host of other refinements required by workstation users. This is work that will improve the workstation experience for Fedora as well as RHEL users and which they hope will positively receive will be positively received by the entire Linux community. The trade-off is that they have to pivot away from work uh, that they've been doing on desktop applications like LibreOffice. There's a few other details here. Um, and they're pretty much, you know, kind of the energy that I'm getting here is that they've contributed to LibreOffice for a long time. I'm guessing that LibreOffice is probably developed enough where they feel like they don't have to keep putting in precious time into developing it. And so they feel like their time is better used for things like improving Wayland. It sucks. Um, I don't think it's the best case scenario, but LibreOffice is open source and it does have a lot of other contributors. Um, and so I do think LibreOffice is fine. It just sucks to have a, mas a massive... Um, company like Red Hat, who's been helping you along for so long, also pull out. So um, yeah, it's a bummer, but I also kind of understand where they're coming from as well. With that, we'll move into our Misfits section. We only have one story, and this is probably the story you want to share with uh, all your friends and family. The headline says, Sextortionists are making AI nudes from your social media images. 
Um, so for those of you who don't know, sextortion is, but it's when they actually do have one way or another, they got a hold of images or videos of you uh, either nude or in some kind of sexual position, and they try to blackmail you. So the FBI warns that sextortionists are now scraping publicly available images of their targets, like innocuous pictures and videos posted on social media platforms. These images are then fed into deep fake content creation tools that turn them into AI-generated sexually explicit content. Towards the end of the article, they give some uh, recommendations from the FBI here. The FBI recommends that parents monitor their children's online activity and talk to them about the risks associated with sharing personal media online. Parents are advised to conduct online searches to determine the amount of exposure their children have online and take action as needed to take down content. Adults posting images or videos online should restrict viewing access to a small private circle of friends to reduce exposure. At the same time, children's faces, faces should always be blurred or masked. Finally, if you discover a deepfake content depicting you on a pornographic site, report it to the authorities and contact the hosting platform to request removal of the offending media. The UK has recently introduced a law in the form of an amendment to the online safety bill that classifies the non-consensual sharing of deepfakes as a crime. And there's a whole bag of other issues with the online safety bill, which has not passed yet, by the way. I'd, I'd, I'd say that's kind of like the bare minimum of actions you can take. It's a good place to start. So just be aware of that. Now let's go into the Q&A. Again, these questions come from our patrons. So if you want to ask us a question, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash surveillance pod. Um, that is down in the description as well. And then you can ask us a question and we'll most likely get back to it next week. So this question comes from Bill Ding, who asks pretty personal questions. So let's see what we're comfortable sharing here. Um, I have a question for you two for the next podcast. What state are you two reporting from? Also, how and why did you two get together to work on this project? Also, did you two go to college? If so, where and what did you study? I always look forward to listening to your podcast each week. Thanks for the valuable service. I don't mind saying that uh, I am in California. Uh, that's pretty public information. You can find that pretty easily. Um, and college is kind of tricky back here. Techler's overall pretty successful, so I put most of my focuses on Techler rather than school, but I do occasionally still take classes here and there. Um, so that's what's going on back here. Um, I think it's easier if Nate shares how we two got, how, us, how we got together for this project <laughs> and anything else he wants to share. Okay, um, yeah, so I'm from Texas. Uh, I did go to college. I will not say where, but I did study liberal arts and, um, uh, for a liberal, liberal arts graduate, I actually make pretty good money. Uh, um, so how we got together was long story short, I was actually doing a very similar podcast to surveillance report, uh, but it was audio only and I was pretty consistent with it. And then I found, um, surveillance report, which was fully tech lore back then. And basically just hit up Henry and was kind of like, hey, you know, I I see you're doing this. And we covered a lot of the same stories. Like when he released episodes, I noticed I'm like, man, we we covered a lot of the same stuff. So I hit him up and was like, hey, you know, I noticed you do this podcast. I've been podcasting for a little bit. Um, I'm pretty consistent with it. Whereas no offense, you are not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I thought maybe if we team up, we could both benefit. I'd get a bigger audience. You'd get more consistency, which would help grow your audience. And he was like, yeah, you know, let's see it out and like try it out and see how it goes. And here we are. If you remember the first episode we did, um, it was like surveillance support title and then feet the new oil featuring the new oil. Yeah, I remember. that. Right. Because it was a it signal was just, story. I remember that, too. Right. It was just kind of like a like we're trying this out, bringing someone on. And then I wanted to see how it went. And, and yeah, I remember we, also the the original plan was we would take turns hosting it. But it turned out the like two host format worked out pretty well. So we just kept doing that. Yeah, I know, I know we've gotten comments in the past from people like when one of us isn't here, people are like, man, no offense, but it's so much better when it's two of you. So, yeah. Right. It's it's nice. It's much better. Um, it's nice to also just uh, take breaks between stories as well. Yeah, no kidding. Thanks, thanks for uh, mentioning that. I thought that was interesting. Our next question comes from Blue Gandalf, who says, what's the best way to be private while selling on marketplaces such as eBay or other alternatives that you might suggest? I have quite a bit of slightly used tech equipment that I want to sell off, but also remain relatively private in the process. Um, you can just send that over to the New Oil Media. I'm kidding. I actually have never sold anything on eBay. Uh, I've purchased, or I think, I don't know, maybe years, years and years ago before I got into privacy. They are probably going to require ID if we're totally honest, um, just because of the whole KYC laws and anti-money laundering and all that stuff. Um, if you're okay with that, then you can use pretty much any platform. I would just say, you know, the usual, use a voice over IP, forwarding email, uh, VPN if you can, 
all that kind of stuff, or maybe even PayPal. Assuming you already have an account, I wouldn't open a PayPal account just for this, but you know, um, because then it puts a layer between you and the site. You know, PayPal may have your bank information, but that doesn't mean the site needs it. So stuff like that. If you want to be a little bit more privacy preserving, I would see about maybe borrowing an existing friend or relative's account with their permission, of course. You know, ask them like, hey, I gotta, I'm trying to sell this like network switch. Can I use your account to list it? And then, I mean, you know, Craigslist is still a thing. And I know it's not what it used to be. Definitely some mixed results there. Yeah, all I was going to add was you can still do local stuff. It's probably not going to be as successful, but um, Craigslist, you can do cash only. Um, you can actually, there's a label uh, or a filter on Craigslist for accepting cryptocurrency, which I think is interesting. So <laughs> you could, in theory, do Monero if you wanted to. Um, so that's definitely the best way to go. But um, especially if you don't live like near a city, uh, it can be pretty pretty bleak. Um, I guess the only thing, and I don't think anyone, no one out there should open a Facebook account just for this. But if you, for whatever reason, have a Facebook account that is accessible to you, or you have a friend or family member with a Facebook account, Facebook Marketplace, I've heard, is pretty good. I wouldn't know because I don't use Facebook, but I've heard only great things about Facebook Marketplace. I've heard that too. I mean, there's definitely your fair share of scams and crap like that, but I've heard like, yeah, Facebook Marketplace is the new Craigslist. It's the new place to sell stuff. All right, so the last one here is from Kixies. It's a very interesting one. I really like this one because it's very particular. Um, so they ask, what privacy respecting antivirus would you recommend for Windows 10? And you might be going, huh, Windows Defender, haha. <laughs> but here's where it gets interesting. So here's the long version. They recently found out there's a vulnerability in Windows 10 Defender where excluded folders, which they use, can be seen by processes running via registry entries. Malicious code could then copy itself to any excluded folder and then run it from there, bypassing Windows Defender in Windows 10. This issue is only fixed in Windows 11, and with the hardware requirements of Windows 11, not everyone can upgrade it just yet. Too long didn't read from them is there's a vulnerability in Windows 10 Defender, which is only fixed in Windows 11, and it doesn't seem like they can upgrade, so should they use a third-party antivirus? Very cool, I mean, it's not a good situation to be in, but from a like teaching perspective, it's a very cool use case that is, I hope, going to open people up a little bit, um, because we always generally say, like, all you need is Windows Defender, but we also say there's generally a use case for pretty much anyone out there, um, for really any tool. And I think that this really, really speaks to that. So first off, you know, this is going to require malicious code to be installed in the first place. And so the first thing I start with, because I think that we're already starting to look at the safety nets, let's start with the actual protections that you have in place. I would personally just be double sure that you have proper browsing habits to reflect your elevated risk. If you happen to receive malware on your device and it becomes installed, that's where you have a problem. This doesn't actually increase your risk of getting malware installed in the first place from the sounds of it. So I would just make sure that you are doubling down on avoiding having malware installed on your system. So making sure all of your browsers are kept up to date. I would personally, and this again is a very specific recommendation. I know some people don't like Google's safe browsing thing, which by the way, if you use Google safe browsing on Firefox or Brave or any other browser, it doesn't mean Google gets your data. It just means they're using Google's safe browsing list. So that's just a very important thing to distinguish there. This is what Firefox does. So Firefox strips string parameters from URLs um, to check download protections. Uh, cookies set by safe browsing service to protect the service from abuse are stored in a separate cookie jar so they're not mixed with regular browser session cookies. And when requesting complete hashes for a 32-bit prefix, Firefox throws in an extra noise entry to obfuscate the original URL. And on top of all of that, um, here's what Mozilla officially says. There are two times when Firefox will communicate with Mozilla's partners while using phishing and malware protection. The first is during the regular updates to the list of reporting phishing and malware sites. No information about you or the sites you visit is communicated during list updates. So it's pretty much fetching, fetching updates what the lists are. And the second is in the event that you encounter a reported phishing or malware site. Before blocking the site, Firefox will request a double check to ensure that the reported site has not been removed from the list since your last update. This request does not include the complete address of the visited site. It only contains partial information derived from the address. And then the only thing that like might be of concern to people um, is in addition to the regular list updates mentioned above, when using malware protection to protect downloaded files, Firefox may communicate with Mozilla's partners to verify the safety of certain executables. In, the, in these cases, Firefox will submit information about the file, like the name 
origin, size, and a cryptographic hash of the contents to the Google Safe Browsing Service, which helps Firefox determine whether or not the file should be blocked. Personally, for someone in your situation who you're on Windows, <laughs> so it's not like you're chasing like absolute 100% privacy in the first place, I think this is a fair trade-off and I would make sure that you're using things like this because it is fairly privacy respecting um, and it only will submit even a small amount of data if something's actually recognized, which hopefully shouldn't happen. But even if it does, it's not very privacy invasive. And I think that I would really be checking these tools out. And for those curious, I'm pulling up the Brave docs. Uh, so Brave Browse, so Safe Browsing and Brave has the following privacy properties. URLs are never sent to the Google operated server. The vast majority of website visits do not lead to server requests. And on desktop, the browser does not connect to the server directly. Instead, it routes through a Brave operated proxy server so that Google servers never see your IP address. So um, there's a lot of other technical details. Long story short, all these Browsers like Firefox and Brave do a very good job of ensuring that this is all done in a privacy respecting way. And I think that like the security benefits of, of this is definitely worth it for most people. But pretty much like I would be looking into high security things when you can um, and really taking advantage of those, making sure you have 2FA set up. I personally avoid things like um, local email clients. So I wouldn't be using like Outlook. I would try to keep everything web-based as much as possible. Um, I would just really be heightening the security of pretty much all of your protections without even thinking about the antivirus. That's where I would start. Regarding the antivirus, I don't know. I, I honestly like don't follow third-party antiviruses very much. I think that, um, and I think Nate said something similar here. You're going to hear about Clam AV in the open source world. And also you're going to see kind of the top recommendations like Bitdefender, Malwarebytes, and things like that. Frankly, I, I really don't know how much of a difference there is between these services. I think they're all probably going to effectively do the same thing. I know they all use pretty much the same virus definitions, so. Henry kind of hinted at this a little bit. I think this is a really good example of how everyone is different. Not everyone is in the same situation and not everyone has the same threat model and things like that. So, you know, um, I, I know sometimes we do get up here and offer advice of like, hey, do this, but you gotta, you gotta remember that's kind of like general advice. Everyone is in a different situation and not 100% of everything we say is going to apply to 100% of people. There's always unique situations. Personally, I would also like to know more about this vulnerability before offering like actual concrete advice. Like Agreed. for example- Agreed, just, um, just disclaimer, I have not read into the vulnerability and all of my information I gave was based on what you shared with us. Just wanna put that yeah. out there. <laughs> yeah, and I'm in the same boat. I've never heard of this before. Um, if you can like leave us a, a comment with like a link to the article, that would be super awesome. But uh, for example, can it be exploited remotely? Is this one of those exploits that requires like physical access to your device? Which I think for most of us, um, Maybe I'm making assumptions here based on my lifestyle. For most of us, I don't think that's really much of a concern. Um, but if it can be exploited remotely, then obviously that is a big concern. Uh, in answer to the actual question, uh, my personal opinion, and I mean, again, everybody's different, and I'm going just off this comment. I don't know anything else about Kixie or anything like that. Um, I think unless you are at an elevated risk, like being targeted, or if you have a, a lot of excluded folders, if you only have one or two, it's probably not a big deal. Um, personally, if I only had one or two, I would just use Defender and roll the dice. If you are in, in a situation where you think, yeah, I kind of need third party, like I have a lot of folders or I am targeted, it's my personal opinion that none of them are really privacy respecting per se. They're all gonna look at your stuff. Uh, they all have to see the folders and stuff like that. Um, we mentioned Clam AV. I've heard of it. I've also heard it leaves a lot to be desired. I've never really super looked into it, to be totally honest with you. Um, like Henry said, Bitdefender, Malwarebytes, they all show up in the reviews. But honestly, I don't know how trustworthy the antivirus reviews <laughs> right. are. It, it gives me like, VPN I, review energy. So <laughs> it, it really does. So I don't know if it's like, because it's just like VPNs, where it's like, if you look up like best, Best uh, Windows antivirus 2023, I guarantee you every single website is gonna have the same five of them. It's just like VPNs. Um, and I honestly don't know if that's because they are literally all that good or if it's just because it's like VPNs and they're all paid for. I really don't know. So um, take that with a grain of salt, do your research. I know Malwarebytes does actually run a malware research lab and they do, in my opinion, they do pretty good research. So that's pretty cool. What did you mention? Oh, Google safe browsing. 
Um, that also made me think of you could use like a trusted DNS provider that blocks malware, like uh, Next DNS, like Molvad yeah. or yeah, Next DNS, Proton. Um, there's a lot of good options out there. Obviously, that's not going to stop everything, but it, it can mitigate some of these attacks. And especially in the case of Next DNS, you can actually see all the DNS requests. So if you review them regularly, then you can see like, hey, I'm seeing this domain I've never seen before. What's going on there? I know that's more reactive, but still it's better than nothing. It's also worth mentioning, use a non-administrator account whenever possible, because a lot of the time malware needs uh, administrative privileges to install itself. Well, let's start uh, kind of finishing up here. So um, again, just to summarize, we got that new to denota email plan. System 76 computers are once again disabling Intel management engine, the whole move it thing, which is gonna be the next Fortra. Um, Apple WWDC updates, Gen Z research got a surprising number of reactions and a lot more. Again, if you like this podcast, Patreon, we could really use the support. We're trying to keep growing this podcast as long as we can go and your support can really help us do that. If you don't like Patreon or whatever, it doesn't matter what the, what your problem is with Patreon. If you don't want to go through that, we also offer Libra pay and we also offer Monero. So we have three really great options for you to support this podcast and keep it growing. Um, we do this weekly. Uh, we only work on this over the weekends. We are now recording Friday nights after we're, you know, Nate, Nate's after Nate's like day job uh, on Friday night, he comes home and he, we record this and then we spend like the whole next day and a half just you know, editing it, publishing it every single week. So uh, we really don't have days off back here because of this podcast. So we could really use any support that you guys can give us. And that's really it. Thank you for listening to the surveillance report. The final thing we want to ask you to do is to share the podcast around, make sure you're subscribed and give us a rating if you're listening from a platform where that is an option. We want privacy to reach as many people as possible and you can help us do that. Thanks again for listening and see you next week for surveillance report 138.